Hello, everyone. I'm Lisa Ling, and this is The Road to a Vaccine, an exploration of the COVID-19 crisis and the global community's efforts to develop a vaccine against the disease. This is the second episode of our new season. Last week, we did a special edition from the AIDS 2020 conference. So today, we are going all in on the latest information around COVID-19. Perhaps the best resource for data following global cases and trends is the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center, and here is what it's telling us. As of today, there are over 12 million cases and 550,000 deaths globally, with the U.S., Brazil, and India topping the list of confirmed cases. Globally, there were over 200,000 new cases in a single day last week, and the spikes seen around the world are suggesting we still have a long way to go. But perhaps the most troubling is the situation here in the U.S., where there are over 3 million cases and over 135 deaths so far. If we look at the percent change in average daily cases since re reopening, we can see that the states that reopen the earliest are the most impacted. And the daily number of deaths is also now rising after months of decline. Over the weekend, Florida reported the highest number of new cases in a single day by any state since the pandemic began. Today, we have a power-packed episode featuring some of the country's top public health officials. First up, we've been hearing a lot of statistics, but what do they really mean? Dr. Tom Inglesby of the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health will help us decipher the data. And Dr. Ashish Jha, director of the Harvard Global Health Institute, will speak to our growing knowledge of the virus and why some countries have been more successful at curbing infection rates than others. Then renowned geneticist and NIH director, Dr. Francis Collins and J&J's chief scientific officer, Dr. Paul Stoffels, discuss their unprecedented partnership. And I'm sure many of you will have questions throughout this episode, so please put them in the comment section and we will do our best to get to as many as we can. I want to welcome back our first guest, Dr. Tom Inglesby, Director of the Center for Health Security at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Dr. Inglesby, it's great to see you again. I have to admit, I didn't think that the next time we spoke, we would be experiencing such a massive surge throughout the U.S., exploding numbers of cases throughout the country. Now, everyone seems to be looking at the numbers and interpreting them differently. So can you paint an epidemiological picture of where the disease is right now and how it's spreading? Yes. <clears throat> Thanks, Lisa. And thanks for uh, having me back on your show. Um, unfortunately, the, the U.S. is not in a good place right now. Uh, we see that even last week we had um, a, a record high in cases, 68,000 cases in one day, which is double the peak that we saw back in early April when we were having our, our first real reckoning with this virus. And as you said in, in your, your comments, we see across the South and in California and other states like Oregon, North Carolina, South Carolina, that we've had a, a steady rise in cases. We've had a rise in hospitalizations. And now in a number of states, we're seeing a clear rise in daily deaths from this disease. So while for some time there was this debate going on around the country about whether the rising cases were related to increased testing, and the answer to that is no, it's, it's because there's more actual more disease and more serious disease. Now I think there can be no debate that we are really struggling in many places in this country to get this epidemic under control. That's right, significantly more people are testing positive these days. For a while, it seemed like the death rates in the US were going down. So does mm -hmm. that mean the, de the virus is less deadly or have we just become better at treating it? There, in some places, there might be a little bit of an improvement in treatment, but even in major medical hospitals, I think we're not seeing a dramatic change in the survival rate of patients that get severe COVID. So that really, I don't think that is an, a serious explanation. I think an, one contributing cause is that in many places in the country, there have been younger people getting this disease and younger people we know do better than older people. But the problem is that we can't contain the disease to younger people and that it is spreading to older people. And as you said earlier as well, there is a lag between the time people get infected and then hospitalized and then get sick enough to be either intubated or to die from this disease. And we're now beginning to see the deaths begin to catch up. They're certainly not where they were back in April, and that's, that's great news, but I don't think we should take comfort from that. I think we may have a lot of trouble with rising deaths in the, in the next couple of weeks. 
Now, we've been hearing a lot lately about airborne transmission. How is this different from what was pre previously thought? And does this explain, uh, do you think, the recent uptick in the rates that we're seeing? No, I don't, I don't think that um, there's been a major change in thinking about airborne transmission. I think there's been a lot of debate about it. The World Health Organization issued new guidance about their thinking on that. And I think where the scientific community is, is gravitating is, is the acknowledgement that there could be a role for airborne transmission in indoor environments where there's poor ventilation. But still, I think the vast majority of spread is at close contact by respiratory droplet, by saliva or direct contact, to some extent by touching surfaces that are contaminated. We don't really know the, the percent of people who get infected by that route, but it's probably much, much lower than respiratory droplet. And then perhaps there could be some contributing element to longer range transmission. We're going to need to do more study of that. But um, I think what the World Health Organization would say is that there are very few cases that cannot be explained by respiratory droplet short range transmission at this point. Dr. Inglesby, uh, despite the escalation of cases in so much of the country and the world, I heard that you don't believe that a total shutdown is necessary. Can you explain that? Well, first of all, I think there are some states that are doing very well. There are some states that have driven their uh, epidemic and within their state borders down to really very, very low numbers. Uh, others are holding their own for now, although things could go in, the, in a different direction in the weeks ahead. Uh, <clears throat> and then the states that are doing poorly, I think there there is uh, the potential that they may need to go back to a stay-at-home order. I don't think it necessarily would need to be the same as it was back in April. We've learned some things. We've learned that outdoor environments are much, much safer than indoor environments. And, and so the idea that people will be actually physically kept in their homes and not be able to go outdoors, that, that's changed, that thinking. Um, but at a minimum, states which are having the, the, worst, the worst epidemics should be reducing and, and disallowing the indoor large gatherings that have been permitted. So that would include the opening of bars and casinos and entertainment venues and large restaurants and churches. We know that that super spreading events occur in those settings and governors have begun to react to that by beginning to close some of those things down, but not uniformly and not quickly enough. So we need, at a minimum, we need to be moving in that direction. If those things don't help and the requirement of face coverings, the mandatory face coverings, if that isn't sufficient, then I think the next, the only next step we have to really lower the spread, it, slow the spread, is to move back to stay-at-home orders. Dr. Uh, Inglesby, we have a question from um, Alubayo from LinkedIn who asks, how much herd immunity do we have now? Unfortunately, it doesn't look like we have anything like herd immunity. I think the calculations around herd immunity are that we probably need to have something in the order of 60 to 70 percent of the population in, uh, with immunity, either by in infection and recovery or by vaccination, in order to get to this concept of herd immunity. And the most recent studies led by CDC show something much more on the order of single digit percent of the country having been infected and recovered by now. And that, those aren't the, the last word on that. I think more seroprevalence studies are certainly planned by CDC and other states, and we'll learn more over time. But we're not, not no seroprevalence study that's been done so far suggests that we're anywhere close to what we would need to have herd immunity, which basically means some protection against ongoing epidemic spread. Dr. Inglesby, uh, you mentioned that some states have, have gotten the virus somewhat under control, but how do you think this inconsistency in messaging from the government has led us to where we are today? I mean, there, there, there is a significant segment of the population of the U.S. that is still in denial or rejects that uh, COVID-19 is anything worse than the flu still. Yeah, unfortunately, I think it's a huge problem, and it's it's relatively, I, I won't say it's unique to the United States. There are some places in the world that are struggling with this, but a very, very small minority of countries in the world are in this situation where things like face coverings have become a political or controversial intervention. 
And uh, we see that in many states, particularly in some of the states that are struggling the worst now, that their political leadership has not supported some of the things that CDC has said were important, or public health experts broadly in the world have said were important. They're now beginning to move in, that, in a better direction, which is, which is great. I think national leadership has also been inconsistent in messaging. Um, they have not, even if at times leaders have been saying that face coverings, for example, are important, they haven't necessarily been wearing face coverings in public, so their actions aren't really consistent with their words. The good news is that that all could be changed in a, in a day. If national leaders, state leaders all began to move in the same direction and pursue the public health interventions that have worked around the world to slow this epidemic down, we could change things rapidly. I believe people would follow their lead, but even now there is inconsistency, and we got to change that if we want to do better. Dr. Inglesby, thank you so much for joining us. I, I really hope that people heed this this warning because uh, you know it, it is it's devastating to see our country uh, getting so out of control. Thank you so much for joining us. That was Dr. Tom Inglesby of the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health uh, for taking the time today. Now, as with any disease or illness, there's science and then there's the patient's perspective. Today, we'll be sharing a couple of COVID-19 patient stories with you that paint a very real picture of the impact of this disease. I am on about 120 days or four months of symptoms of COVID, and I have had symptoms that range from head to toe. Disorientation, severe nausea, especially in the morning to the point where I can't stand, I can't walk, I'll have to crawl just to use the restroom. Uh, Short-term memory loss, which is very new to me as someone that's always had a good memory. Um, to gastrointestinal issues, including severe lower esophagus burning whenever I breathe, um, to severe diarrhea episodes um, that were happening for well over 90 days consecutively. I've had severe chest pain, lung pain. I've had dermatological issues such as COVID toes um, and rashes on my body that have persisted and come back at various stages of relapses. And I have had issues including emotional issues um, such as depression due to the isolation and the trauma that COVID has caused. I was incredibly active um, and fit before this and now have chronic complications as a result of this virus um, that are still occurring, um, including relapses that uh, come due to exertion. And that was Lauren sharing her journey with COVID-19. Still uh, pretty astounding that, that the virus can be so devastating even for young people. Our next guest is Dr. Ashish Jha, renowned global health researcher and director of the Harvard Global Health Institute. Dr. Jha, thank you so much for, for being with us. I noticed you changed your Twitter handle to Ashish, the pandemic is still with us, Jha. I, I guess that says a lot. Yeah, thank you for having me on. Um, you know, it was it was a bit of on a whim, but it was really reflecting uh, what has been, I think, a sentiment among some chunk of people that we're done. The pandemic is behind us, uh, and not only are we is the pandemic still with us. Uh, in many ways, as Dr. Inglesby said, we're in the early days of the pandemic uh, in the U.S. and around the world. So we have many, many months to go, and we've really got to get our act together. How would you say doctors and scientists' understanding of the virus has progressed since the early days of the pandemic? Well, this has been one of the real, I would say, silver linings, bright lights, whatever you want to say. It's been extraordinary. The scientific community, what it has accomplished in the last six months is unprecedented. Um, from the early days of sequencing the genome and di creating diagnostic tests to just learning about how the disease has spread, we have now two therapies that have been shown in randomized controlled trials to improve outcomes, remdesivir and dexamethasone. Um, we've done randomized trials that have shown that other therapies don't work, which is also scientific advancement. Um, we have many, many, many uh, clinical trials that are still ongoing. Uh, the story on vaccines, of course, everybody's been tracking very closely. Uh, again, unprecedented feels to me like an understatement of what the scientific community has done on that realm. Um, and, but there's other stuff that has uh, come about, the learnings that I would say have been uh, upsetting, disturbing, just what we're learning about the long-term effects of this virus, uh, the way it is transmitted. There's a lot that I and we all understand now that we didn't a couple of months ago, and a lot of it is very sobering. 
we just heard from Lauren, who is a young woman who was sharing um, the, the long-term effects that she is feeling. Um, would you say that, that what she's experiencing, these effects are, are, are permanent or could be permanent? Well, I certainly hope not. And uh, I think there's a good chance that they won't be, uh, that she will recover. But what we're learning is two things. First, there's a lot of people who've been very cavalier about what this disease does to younger people. They basically, there's been an argument that if you're under 60 or if you're under 50, it's milder than the flu. I think we can feel pretty confident if we're going to be evidence-based that that is not the case. Uh, obviously, people who are younger do better than people who are older, but you do see stories like Lauren's, and, th and they're not rare. Um, second is we don't know the long-term effects of this disease because we haven't had this disease for that long. And so I, I can't tell you what it's going to be in a year or two, what people who've been infected. But uh, you know, the, the cautionary principle says we should try to protect people uh, and not assume that the, there won't be any long-term effects, when all of the data seems to suggest that there probably will be some. Well, this is a crucial period right now because so many hospitals are, are filling up throughout this country with young people. So uh, I think we'll get a better sense in, in the coming days and weeks uh, about how it affects young people. Now, when we look at where the cases are increasing, the U.S. is going up while so many countries are going down. What is working in those countries that have been successful in combating COVID-19? And, and what should governments worldwide be doing to try and get this virus under control at this point? Yeah, it's a great question, you know, and, and people are always sort of looking for that uh, magic sauce. And, and there are many elements of the, of, the, uh, of the magic sauce or the magic formula. To me, the single biggest element, the, the one ingredient that's critical is countries that have gotten this virus under control have taken the virus seriously. And that means they've taken slightly different approaches. New Zealand was primarily about being shut down for long enough to get the virus under control. Uh, Italy also obviously did not take the virus as seriously as they should have initially, but then had a very vigorous uh, shutdown. South Korea took a different approach. South Korea took a much more aggressive testing and tracing approach. And Germany has had a bit of mix of all of that, has had good testing and tracing, good social distancing, good mask wearing policy. It's a combination. So my point is there's no one approach that gets us there, but all of those countries took the virus very seriously, and that's what differentiates them from us. Dr. Jaw, I have a question from Pamela from Facebook who asks, this is a, a really uh, question on top of, on the, at the top of many people's minds. What is the feeling about sending children, teacher, and support staff to school? Can it be safe? Will the children and staff um, bring the virus home to families? Yeah, so here's what we know and don't know. Um, what we know is obviously kids, let's just talk about kids for a second, kids are less likely to get sick. Uh, so that's good news, very good news. Um, second is most of the evidence, and this is not so clear because again, our data is not so strong, uh, but most of the evidence says that kids are less likely to transmit, uh, which is also good news. But the problem is that in large parts of the country, we have very large outbreaks happening. And as Dr. Inglesby said in the earlier part, the single biggest risk factor for spreading is bringing large numbers of people indoors for extended periods of time, i.e. schools. Now, if you're in a region where there is not a hotspot, like Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Michigan, other places, you probably can with good social distancing, good ventilation, um, mask wearing, you probably can run schools. Um, if you're in Arizona right now, if you're in Phoenix, or if you're in Texas, Houston, I don't know how you open schools because the level of virus in the community is so large. So for those communities, my policy prescription is simple. Uh, get extremely aggressive about bringing the virus levels down, and then you probably can have a shot at opening up schools safely. We have another question from Joto Prakesh from LinkedIn who asks, can we say recovery rates are varied by different regions in the world? You know, recovery rates are a funny metric, and I have to be honest with you, I don't understand them. Because the, basically what recovery rates is, you know, as people are using them, is proportion of people who didn't die, people who got infected and then quote unquote recovered. But we think the infection fatality rate for this virus is somewhere around 0.6, 0 0.8%. Um, not much lower, probably not much higher across the globe. 
Um, that means when it's all said and done, 99 plus percent of people who get infected should recover or at least should not die from the virus. Many of them will have long-term consequences. Um, the problem is countries are comparing uh, recovery rates, but their testing regimens are different. They're identifying different subsets of populations. So I don't find it a very useful metric. I think much more useful is to look at uh, how many people are being infected, how many people are dying, uh, and then, of course, uh, infection fatality rates, if they're higher, uh, trying to understand why that might be in one country over another. I mean, there is this school of thought because uh, recovery rates have been so high that we can just ride this out. How do you respond to that? Yeah, you know, if only were the case. It'd be great, right? It'd be great. We could just you know, open up our economy. The problem is there are two parts of the problem. First of all, um, let's just take the death numbers, for instance. Even if you assume an infection fatality rate of 0.6%, which is about as low as I think is reasonable based on the current data. Um, you know, if, if in a country like the United States, where you have to get to 60 or 70% of people getting infected before you get herd immunity, uh, that's about 200 million, 210 million people apply a 0.6%, you're still going to have more than a million Americans die. Plus, what we know is among survivors, people who don't die, 5 to 10% get pretty sick, and many of them have long-term consequences. So, I, no, I don't want a policy where a million Americans die and tens of millions of Americans are extremely sick and suffer long-term consequences. I think it's wholly unnecessary. We don't have to do that. Dr. Jha, it is finally sinking in in this country that masks are protective and protect. What else should individuals and societies be doing to protect themselves? Yeah, so what we know right now is certainly mask wearing is, I think, critical. And anytime you're outside of your home, you should be wearing a mask. Uh, and the second thing we've learned over the last few months is indoors is much riskier than outdoors. And so in general, what I encourage people to do is if you can, if anything you want to do, if you can do it outside, it's just going to be much, much safer. A flip side of that is I just don't think we should be gathering much indoors right now in, in any sort of a large group setting. Um, and then third, I think hand washing remains a pretty much a cornerstone. We've been saying that from the early days. I think it's still important. And then from a societal point of view, we've got to have as a country, we've got to have the kind of testing and tracing infrastructure that a, a wealthy, intellectually rich a nation like ours should be able to develop. And somehow we have not been able to do that, uh, largely because of a failure of federal leadership. I want to ask you one more question from LinkedIn. Jen is asking, do we know the long-term effects of having and recovering from COVID for different age groups? We've seen studies on lasting uh, lung, heart, and blood issues. Yeah, there's a lot we don't know about this, uh, Jen, and I wish I, I could tell you more. There's a really good study about a week ago in uh, JAMA that looked at people who recovered uh, in Italy. The median age was about 55, 56. So a lot of people in their 30s and 40s, a lot of people in their 60s and 70s, uh, 60 days out, two months out. Uh, nearly 90% still had symptoms. Many of them were feeling fatigue. Many of them had shortness of breath two months after uh, being hospitalized or after being discharged. So it's a very serious issue that once you get sick enough to be in the hospital, we're seeing a lot of uh, morbidity. You know, we, we're still learning how much of that varies by age and other clinical conditions. Still so much to, to learn. Dr. Ashish Jha, Dr. Ashish, the pandemic is still with us, Jha, from the Harvard Global Health Institute. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Really uh, insightful, important information. Thank you. This is the Road to Vaccine, and we are live. Don't forget, this is your opportunity to go directly to the source. If you have questions, please put them in the comment section, and we will do our best to get them answered. Our next segment is Vaccines 101, where we talk directly to scientists and leaders who create and distribute vaccines about just how complex the road to a successful vaccine candidate is. Now, right now, there are some exciting developments as more vaccines are entering human clinical trials. By ramping up manufacturing capability while simultaneously testing vaccines, the scientific community hopes to accelerate the development uh, timeline. So today, we have Ramo Calaruso, Vice President Janssen Supply Chain at Johnson & Johnson to give us an update on their latest developments. Ramo, so nice to see you again. It's been uh, a few weeks since we last spoke, and, and I know so many people are really eager to know where you are in the vaccine uh, upscaling process. Yeah, first of all, thank you for having me back, and uh, it's a pleasure to, to kind of share with you all how we're doing with our vaccine program. Yeah, back in May when we talked, 
we were just starting uh, uh, the small laboratory scale experiments where we were making our vaccine for the first time. We were running that at basically a two, uh, 10 liter scale, like basically two and a half gallons. Um, and, and we got some very good results. And then we have to upscale. We have to figure out how to make it 50 liters at a time, and then ultimately a thousand liters at a time. And so uh, being that this is not our first vaccine in our platform, this is now you know, our third, fourth vaccine candidate. Um, we've developed a lot of science around how we best do that upscaling. And I have to say uh, the pharmaceutical group that's been focused on this has done an amazing job leveraging all of that technology and experience and we were able to go right off the bat with our first 50 liter experiment, ran great. We're now making, we've hit, made three or four of them. And now literally we are about one week away from, uh, from our first, completing our first 900 liter run. These runs take 30 days. So, you know, when you start them, it's not like you can instantly get results. And the fact that we've been able to, to upscale that quickly has been a, a very great and remarkable accomplishment on the, on the part of the pharmaceutical development group. It certainly has. Now, now, phase one and phase two clinical trials are, are soon to be underway. Can you explain what typically happens, how you prepare, how you distribute uh, it to the trial sites? Can you, can you kind of uh, walk us through the process? Sure, sure. And we've been doing this, obviously, for a very long time as a, as a pharmaceutical company. Uh, clinical trials are different than, than uh, you know, our commercial manufacturing uh, uh, processes. And the reason is, we make so many that we make one time and never again. The, the, the failure rate of drugs is very, very high. Uh, so, so we have a very specific uh, group called the clinical supply chain that's focused on specifically making product, many products, maybe for the for one time only, and then getting ready for, for human testing. So, uh, uh, you know, about a month and a half ago, we made our drug substance. That's the actual, actual active ingredient of our vaccine. And then we, we ship that over to what we call our clinical supply unit. Our clinical supply unit then actually fill that into a, a, a vial, uh, which is what will be administered to the patients or to the subjects. Um, and for the vaccine, that was done a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we have pictures from uh, you know, the, uh, our clinical manufacturing facility uh, with, with the vials all labeled, ready to go. Um, but then it comes to the very interesting part, right? It, we have to actually get it to the patients at the various clinical sites around the world. Um, many of those sites are here in the United States. So uh, vaccines are very, um, uh, very uh, require cold uh, transport. Uh, so we actually have a lot of technology around keeping our vaccine vials very cold, uh, frozen or refrigerated. Uh, right now we're starting with frozen because we just don't have the stability to prove that it's okay just being refrigerated. But we literally airship that over to the United States. We have, we pack them in dry ice. We have it insulated. We have temperature uh, sensors the, temp the entire way to make sure that we maintain the temperature conditions. Uh, we haven't even have these internet devices that we could actually track via GPS where that vaccine was across the ocean as it flew over. So a uh, lot of sophisticated tools that we use to make sure the products go where they need to go. They get to the pa to patients or the subject in this case, the clinical sites, uh, where they're then will be administered to our phase one and phase two clinical trials. Talk about precious cargo. Uh, do, do you know how many uh, trial sites there will be for, for phase one? You know, there, there, that's a developing thing. I think there's at least uh, six or seven across all different parts of the United States. Um, and, uh, you know, the, th this is, again, phase one is where we test healthy humans, right? So we're just testing to make sure the vaccine is safe as we've done in our, our previous studies preclinically. And, um, and, and, and we just inject it, we look, we monitor uh, to make sure that there's no adverse effects. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's rel relatively limited. Uh, so we don't need a lot of sites around the world. Um, when we get to the phase three trials, which is much later and much bigger, then, uh, then it will be, uh, uh, you know, lots and lots of sites all over the world uh, and it'll be a placebo controlled trial. So we have not only the vaccine, but also the placebo to administer. So it gets very complicated. Phase ones are, are relatively straightforward because you're just looking for the safety signal that gives you confidence. You can then expand your testing and test for efficacy or efficacy in phase three. 
Remo Colorusso, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. We will look forward to updates from you uh, as, as trials progress. Thank you again. My pleasure. Have a great day. Now, in case you've just joined us, you are watching The Road to a Vaccine. We are getting answers to the questions that everyone's asking about COVID, and we invite you to put your questions in the comments section. Now, throughout the pandemic, one thing we've learned is that defeating COVID-19 requires teamwork across many sectors of society. To talk about their unprecedented collaboration, I wanna welcome two special guests. Dr. Francis Collins is a renowned geneticist who in 1989 discovered the gene that causes cystic fibrosis. He formerly led the Human Genome Project and he's currently director of the National Institutes of Health. And we're also joined again by visionary scientist and chief scientific officer for J&J, &J, Dr. Paul Stoffels. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us today. Dr. Collins, the, the NIH has been at the center of multiple public health crises from cancer, HIV, heart disease, and now COVID. What would you say you've learned over the years that you are applying to this current COVID-19 crisis? Well, quite a number of things. I've been fortunate to be the NIH director now for 11 years, which is longer than any of my predecessors. So presumably I should have learned something by now. And one of the things I have learned is that when you're facing a really tough problem, and especially when human lives are at risk and time matters, you need to get all of the partners together and you need to figure out how collectively we can do more than we can do separately. Certainly that has been the case with COVID-19. And I could say a little bit about how we've tried to do that in this instance, bringing together partners from the private sector, from the government, from academia, from FDA and CDC, the Veterans Administration, the Department of Defense, uh, BARDA, and uh, other partners as well to try to say, what could we do together, both for vaccines and for therapeutics, that otherwise would take longer and maybe would not be so efficient. There's a lot of things that we can do here if we are bold enough uh, to set priorities uh, fearlessly and also not to worry too much about who gets the credit. And that was the basis uh, for forming this partnership called ACTIVE, which stands for Accelerating COVID-19 Therapeutic Interventions and Vaccines which has been a consuming passion for me since uh, the first meeting to talk about this on just April the 2nd, and which now is the way in which we have brought a lot of these parties together. 18 companies are now taking part of this. And I'm delighted to say that I am joined here for this conversation by my co-chair of the Active Executive Committee, Paul Stoffels, who has just been a wonderful partner in bringing all of these folks together to think collectively about how we can go faster, but we can also be scientifically rigorous in every step. And that's what we need. We need speed, but we need rigor. The public is waiting for those answers. Well, Dr. Stoffels, can you talk a little bit about ACTIVE and, and, and how important these public-private uh, partnerships are in, in tackling these, these massive global health challenges? Well, we learned over the last 20, 30 years, and especially since the emergence of HIV, that working together across all these different partners is very important. We never would have reached a point where we are now with HIV without having all the similar type of partners working together, government, academia, um, foundations, but also industry. And industry not just local, but global, and partners not just local, but global. And so it learned us that we can go much faster in identifying the scientific pathways, much faster in biomarkers, but also collaborating with regulators on how can we get to faster clinical clinical trials, and while still respecting the rigorous scientific pathway to how do you bring a, a valid new medicine or new vaccine forward. And that, that is what HIV learned us. From that, we went to different other par partnerships and collaborations. In Ebola, for example, was also, uh, it was not a real pandemic, but really an epidemic of, of very significant concern. Again, all partnerships, including WHO, NIH, you name it, uh, different international organizations came together and industry to combat that. When Zika uh, emerged, again, we activated a, a partnership to do that. And we learned over time that um, if you can build on common platforms, yeah, and that whether it's vaccine platforms, drug platforms, diagnostics, you can get to speed, you can get to manufacturing, you learn, you learn about the safety, uh, uh, common networks where you can test clinical trials, where people are standby almost to do clinical trials on a global basis, as well as laboratory networks. You know, 
which are very critical in clinical evaluation. So we learned over the years that when something like a COVID happens, collaboration is what needs to happen to get it solved. And that is what we are, on, uh, what we are activating with ACTIVE. COVID was not just vaccines. Uh, it's not just vaccines, it's also therapeutics, interventions, uh, as, as Francis was saying. And that's where industry is much broader involved now than any time before on uh, working on all the different elements uh, where um, even diagnostic drugs, um, therapies for, uh, for mitigation, but also therapies for virus, as well as for vaccines. Dr. Collins, we've talked a lot on this show about vaccines, but where would you say we are in the way of therapeutics and treatments for COVID? Well, those are really critical because until we have the vaccine, people are still getting sick. And in the United States, lots of people at risk here. So we want to get those therapeutics pushed through in really rigorous trials to find out what works and for which category of patients they should be offered. We already have two therapeutics that we know are going to work uh, for the right patients, remdesivir, which has its best promise for hospitalized patients who are not yet on a ventilator, and also uh, dexamethasone, a steroid, which was shown in a very nice uh, British study uh, to be uh, life-saving for the most advanced cases, people who had really serious lung disease where the immune system seems to have overreacted to the point where it needs to be toned down a bit in order to help the person recover. But there's lots of other therapeutics we want to test. Other immunomodulators are about to find their way into a rigorous trial. Certainly uh, various types of passive immunization, convalescent plasma being the simplest one, but then intravenous immunoglobulin, hyperimmune uh, as the next step, and then monoclonal antibodies, which are about to get into trials uh, for COVID-19 patients, both inpatients and outpatients in the coming weeks. All of this has been much facilitated by the active partner where we have people from industry and academia and NIH all sitting together to design master protocols and to figure out which therapeutics ought to be prioritized, which is really important because when we started ACTIVE, there were more than 400 ideas that people had about therapeutics that might work, and you can't possibly run 400 clinical trials at once. You need to decide which is the greatest promise, and that was worked through by a very objective process, and I think we can now confidently say the resources that we have for doing trials are being well spent. So I think we should be optimistic that along the way here in the next couple, three months, we are going to see some additional therapeutics that are proven to be effective, that will help people while we're waiting for the vaccine to come through, that's gonna make it possible to prevent this disease. And lots of people who are still waiting for that and like me, staying at home to keep themselves safe in the meantime. Certainly we are eager eager for that, uh, that to come available. Uh, gentlemen, I have a question from Krista from LinkedIn who, uh, or sorry, Khalil from LinkedIn who asks, do you think a single vaccine could cover different strains of the virus? Dr. Stoffels, do you want to answer that? Well, at the moment, the strain is quite stable and the, and the variations which we have seen um, still are, are covered by the vaccine, at least, which we have been working on. So we are testing that continuously. Uh, let's say hopefully the strain doesn't move or doesn't change too much so that the vaccines we are developing can uh, can can really help with that uh, with with that to get it under control at the moment it looks reasonably okay but Francis probably can also give some answers on how how risky it is Francis to have a uh, a next strain here uh, uh, coming over the world mm. Well, it is an RNA virus, and so we know it will mutate, and we've been watching that closely, and now tens of thousands of sequences have been derived on this coronavirus as it has passed itself around the world. There is one major variant that has emerged, uh, the so-called D614G, and that's an interesting one because the data seems to be gathering in compelling nature that the new variant, the, the, the G, uh, is more infectious uh, than the original version that came out of Wuhan. But that doesn't seem to translate into being more severe as far as the severity of the disease. But it may explain why it's so easily spread, including by asymptomatic people, or why that has gotten even more impressive. But that does not affect uh, the response that would happen to the vaccines. The variant we're talking about there does not fall within the domain that the vaccines are directed or the monoclonal antibodies. But we got to watch this and make sure there's not a clone emerging that would be resistant uh, to one of our approaches. And believe me, a lot of monitoring will be going on to check that out.
Absolutely. Uh, I have another question from Crystal from LinkedIn. How are we differentiating the number of cases that show those who have had COVID-like symptoms versus the number of cases of positive COVID-19 diagnoses? I feel as though many states in the U.S. have struggled to distinguish diagnosable symptoms resulting in false positive misdiagnosis, increased revisits, and spread. Well, maybe I'll start with that. Certainly, this is about the diagnostics. I, I think we do have very highly sensitive and specific tests that can determine whether somebody is actually infected with this SARS-CoV-2 virus. They're based upon nucleic acid analyses, specifically using PCR to amplify the RNA genome of the virus. The problem we currently have in the U.S. is that they're very backed up in terms of being able to determine the result and get the answer back. Uh, and so it may be days after somebody has gone in for a test before they get the result. And if the result is positive and they weren't already self-isolating, uh, that means more spread may have been happening during that timetable. One of the things we're working on at NIH is something called RADx, which stands for Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics, trying to speed up the availability of point of care tests that are done right on site that give you a result within an hour so that you immediately know who's infected and can get them quickly isolated. That would be a huge advance, but it's technologically much more challenging than having a big box lab somewhere that receives samples and runs them all in one big batch, especially if they could do it by pooling. But we have to get better at the diagnostic part if we're going to really practice the best public health measures right now when the disease is still spreading and we need to stop that by identifying who's got it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Collins, I've been reading a lot about the link between blood type uh, and, and the risk of acquiring COVID-19. As a geneticist, what role would you say blood type plays in people's response to the disease? Well, yeah, you are asking the genome guy, so you know I'm going to say <laughs> something about the fact that it would be amazing if this disease didn't have host factors encoded within the genome that make some people more susceptible and some less so. And there's already early data about that, although I wish it was a larger group and that we had really validated the initial findings. But one of the initial findings was that there is a variation in the genome that happens to be right where the coding is for the ABO blood group. So it's probably the blood group itself. And it looks as if people who have A blood type are more susceptible to severe disease and people who have O blood type are less susceptible. But don't get me wrong, it's a fairly modest effect. You could have O like I do and still get into real trouble. So people shouldn't be using this uh, to vary the cautions that they're taking about their own health. Why that should be is a mystery to me. I can't come up with a good mechanism about why blood type would matter uh, with this particular virus, but there must be something there. And there's also another variant on chromosome three that looks like it's pretty interesting, but we don't know exactly what mechanism that is either. We need more data. Hopefully as we get that, it will point us in the direction of good ideas about prevention and treatment. Dr. Stoffel, do you have any input on, on whether blood type could affect the severity of, of, of one's a disease? No, it's not my expert, expertise, but at the same time, like uh, Francis saying, I wouldn't rely on being safer with another blood type. Uh, the, 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 the prevention measures need to be the same and even, uh, even enhanced at the moment in risk areas. Uh, I wanted to add something to the diagnostic question you had earlier is that, um, yeah, going into the fall, the challenge of, of diagnostic is even going to be more challenging as, as other other epidemics uh, or other infections could come around as co a cold, flu, and, and RSV. Other diseases can come around. And so getting the diagnostic system right over in a very short time is going to be very important. We have never seen such a need for diagnosis for infectious diseases as now. Like we have never seen a need for a vaccine, such a large scale vaccine as now. And so in parallel vaccines and diagnostics, but also medicines, of course, need to be uh, need to be upskilled and available on a global basis very quickly to combat this disease. Um, lots of work to be done by, by uh, the combination of industry, academia, and research centers in the world and the clinical laboratories to make this happen. There's good hope that point-of-care tests will develop very quickly 
We have, invo we have been involved in some of those rapid diagnostics with our external innovation activities with, uh, with JDDC and, and our uh, capabilities there. And it's absolutely possible, but again, scaling up very quickly to the millions and to the hundreds of millions is the challenge here for uh, being able to serve so many people. So exactly. lots of work to be done. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Collins, you are one of the world's most renowned scientists, uh, but you also haven't been shy about uh, how important your faith is to you. Mm -hmm. There are people who believe that these times uh, seem to be somewhat biblical. How, how would you respond to that? Well, I would say from my perspective, because I am a person of faith, all times are biblical in a certain sense. <laughs> Uh, we, of course, need not to overstate the uniqueness of this moment. Uh, down through the centuries, plagues have been uh, affecting us in various ways. And perhaps we in the modern era have felt somewhat protected against that because science has made it possible to have things like vaccines and antibiotics. But we're being reminded <laughs> that we are not at the point yet where we have eliminated those things just with our scientific approaches. I think when something of this sort happens, uh, we are all called to look more closely at what really matters. Uh, David Brooks, uh, writing in the uh, New York Times a couple of months ago, uh, wrote a, a column called The Moral Significance of the Plague, uh, where we are called uh, to say, okay, not just why did this happen, which doesn't really have a good, easy answer, but what should I do about it? And how should a circumstance like this cause me to reach out even more than before to people who are especially hurt by this experience and need help, even though I'm going to have to keep my mask on and keep my social distance while I'm doing it. Uh, there's a wonderful uh, 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 theologian uh, named uh, Tom Wright, N.T. Wright, who wrote a piece in Time magazine about what is uh, the religious significance of coronavirus and basically calling upon all of us to look a bit more deeply into what we are considering as the most important issues in life and also to recognize there's a time just to lament. And I think we have encountered that time. It will inspire us, I hope, to work even harder to get through this. But there's no question about it. This is a time of suffering, of grief, of anxiety, of fear. For me as a person of faith, faith is a wonderful rock to stand on when I'm in the midst of a storm like this. Dr. Francis Collins of the NIH and Dr. Paul Stoffels, J&J's Chief Scientific Officer, thank you so much for your expertise and taking the time to be with us today. Really appreciate those profound thoughts. Thanks. It was nice to be part of this. Now, earlier I mentioned we'd be telling survivor stories, and it's time for our next personal account. This one is from David, a legal recruiter and journalist based in New York who had a severe case of COVID, was hospitalized, and is finally recovering at home with his family. I first got sick with COVID-19 in early March and was admitted to the hospital on March 16. I spent 17 days in all in the hospital, including six days on a ventilator, and I was discharged on April 1. When I first got back from the hospital, I was extremely weak. I got winded or short of breath very easily. I used to run for miles. I completed the New York City Marathon uh, years ago. Uh, but now uh, I found myself unable to walk even half a block. Uh, I couldn't stand for the duration of a shower. Uh, I had a terrible cough that lasted for weeks and weeks. Uh, but at some point in June, I felt a lot better. My cough went away and I was able to get my strength back. But I'm still not back to my old self. I still can't run, for instance. Taking a gallon of milk out of the fridge for my son feels like a 30 pound barbell. I'm still recovering, but I do feel a lot, lot better compared to when I first got out of the hospital. I'm still trying to get my head around what I went through. COVID made me sicker than I have ever been. And it just underscored to me that we are not invincible. It just reminded me of my own, well, mortality, I guess. I just have a tremendous gratitude for still being here and for being alive. Thank you, for David, for sharing that story of resilience and recovery, and really it's such a reminder of how seriously we need to take uh, this virus, even for young people. 
Um, we are all together in this road to a vaccine and the situation is continuing to change rapidly. I hope we've been able to shed some light on where we are at the present moment um, from an incredible lineup of some of the world's leading experts. Next week, we'll be talking about how safe it is to go back to school and how COVID is affecting our young ones. We'll see you next week.